welcome to our uh, the last panel of this day. Um, and and you guys are the diehards that are still here and hopefully can pay attention for another uh, 70 minutes or so. Uh, so this, um, this panel is entitled um, Asia's Changing Strategic Landscape, uh, Sustaining the Long Peace. And, and we're going to sort of take four cuts at this question, uh, looking at it from a sort of a broad strategic basis, looking at it from a, a military basis, looking at it from an economic basis, and, and finally from a technological, high-tech basis. And um, the, we have a terrific lineup. These are all people who are well known to all of you, I'm sure, and uh, leaders in each of these uh, fields of, uh, in Asian studies. So I'll, I'll just do very quick introductions, but I won't dwell on them because, as I said, these people are all very well known to you. Um, so Bonnie Glazer from, the, uh, from CSIS, uh, Senior Advisor for Asia and Director of the China Power Project. Uh, she's also a non-resident fellow at the Lowy Institute and a senior associate at the Pacific Forum. She has worked for more than three decades at the intersection of Asia-Pacific geopolitics and U.S. policy, and a, a go-to quote for the New York Times. Um, immediately to uh, her left is uh, Lindsay Ford, who is the Director of Political Security Affairs uh, for the Asia Society Policy Institute. Um, she uh, served in a variety of roles in uh, the Department of Defense, uh, most recently as the Senior Advisor to the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Asian and Pacific Security Affairs. So she's immersed in all these issues of America's uh, forward deployment and the types of decisions uh, presidents will face in that area in coming years. Immediately to Lindsay's left is David Dollar, uh, who uh, is uh, from is sitting here on home turf. He's the senior fellow in the John Thornton China Center at Brookings. Um, uh, David is well known in uh, all matters having to do with the uh, China economics trade. Uh, he was from twenty uh, from two thousand nine to two thousand thirteen uh, the Treasury Department's economic and financial emissary to China based in Beijing, and prior to that worked for uh, 20 years for the World Bank, serving, among other things, as country director for China and Mongolia. Uh, and then finally, uh, on the other end of the panel is Helen Toner, uh, who is the director of strategy at Georgetown Center for Security and Emerging Technology. Um, she worked prior to that at the Open Philanthropy Project, where she advised policymakers and grant makers on AI policy and strategy. Um, Helen lived uh, prior to that in Beijing for nine months, where she studied um, the Chinese artificial intelligence ecosystem as a researcher for Oxford University. And she was the lead co-author of a very important report on the malicious uses of artificial intelligence. So that's the lineup. Um, what I'm going to do is ask each of the panelists to uh, give some opening remarks. They're going to be very brief, no more than 10 minutes, just laying out the highlights um, of this changing landscape. But before I do that, I wanted to do one thing, which was as a way of maybe setting the tone for our discussion, uh, just pull out the relevant language that was in the Trump administration's national security strategy uh, document uh, that issued um, last year, uh, which uh, described both China and Russia as strategic adversaries of the United States. And, 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 and some of the key language was, after being dismissed, quote, after being dismissed as a phenomenon of an earlier century, great power uh, competition has returned. Uh, it described both China and Russia, but for our purposes, China, as a society determined to make economies less free and less fair, to grow their militaries, and to control information and data, to repress their societies, and expand their influence. So certainly in the uh, corridors of power in Washington, there's a new, I won't say entirely new, but there is a, a growing consensus that is far more... Um, ominous about the role China's playing uh, both in the region and globally, and I'm sure that'll be uh, a centerpiece of what we talk about today. But with that, take it away, Bonnie. I'll start with you. 
Thanks, Mark, and uh, thanks to all of you for being here. I was essentially asked to talk about China's uh, foreign policy ambitions and then maybe a little about, a bit about what it would look like if there were a China-led Asia. So the first thing that I would say is that I think that uh, China's uh, or Xi Jinping's ambitions for China are really not a mystery. Um, we know he articulated them at the 19th Party Congress in October of 2017. He talked about uh, China uh, becoming a uh, a you know great nation, the national rejuvenation. This is not a, a new goal, of course, for China. He said this should have take place by 2049, the centennial of the PRC's founding. And by that time, the army, he said, should be a first-class military. And, of course, he declared a new era in which uh, China would move to the center of the world stage. Not quite clear um, what that means, but it certainly means putting China, I think, on a par with other with other countries and uh, in increasing its ability to defend its own interests. So foreign policy in, is, in essence, is aimed at creating an international environment that will facilitate the achievement of these goals. Uh, for all intents and purposes, I think it's clear that China has abandoned Deng Xiaoping's, you know, hide and bide or uh, keep a low profile. Uh, Xi Jinping has articulated something he calls its fun fayo way, which is to be proactive, strive for achievement, um, obviously different uh, than uh, his, uh, his predecessors, although Hu Jintao was, to be fair, a transition period toward that. Some people say that China's ambitions are really primarily regional and not global, um, and I don't completely uh, agree with that. I don't think China is focused exclusively on its periphery, although its periphery is a priority, particularly for its security. But when you look at the uh, goal that Xi Jinping has articulated, the being a leader in the reform of global governance, that word is global governments, it's not regional, um, and, for example, China is very explicit in its view uh, that the global governance system is unfair, it's unreasonable, it needs to be changed. It's not always clear what changes uh, China wants to make in this system. But there are a few examples um, that we can identify. The current uh, global governance system obviously privileges liberal democratic values and uh, standards, and China's stated goals include diluting democratic principles um, and replacing them or augmenting them with authoritarian principles. And uh, I understand there was a discussion the last panel, and I'm sorry I missed it, but Xi Jinping's talk about community of common destiny for mankind. In my view, this is pushing a vision of global, for global governance in which uh, the state, not always the individual, is the, uh, the ultimate authority. So um, China is also seen as pushing for new international norms, especially when those norms are seen as threatening to China's political system. So human rights, internet freedom would probably be the two areas that China has proactively pushed to introduce its own norms um, that allow not just for protecting, of course, individual interests, but also privileging state interests um, that favor China's authoritarian preferences. In the Human Rights Council, there are several uh, 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 examples of China introducing language and resolutions that incorporate Chinese norms uh, that pr actually potentially provide states an opportunity to abuse human rights in the pursuit uh, of other interests. And we can also see this in the digital space where China has pushed an agenda of sort of baking in authoritarian principles into uh, global internet governments. So these examples um, of Chinese revisionism, at least to me, suggests that China is a uh, sort of select revisionist power. You didn't quote the particular line in the national security strategy that says that China and Russia are revisionist powers. I don't see China as seeking to upend the post-World uh, War II liberal out international order. China's probably been the largest um, a beneficiary of that order. But there are areas in which China sees the global uh, governance system as threatening um, Chinese interests, and they are seeking to introduce changes. I think in the future we might see China seek to introduce similar changes um, that would defend its interest in international maritime law, uh, 
um, norms and practices perhaps uh, in the World Bank and IMF, I think to some extent we're also seeing, and maybe WTO, WTO reform if that ever gets underway. And it goes without saying that U.S. disengagement from the multilateral arena provides China with increased opportunity to press its ambitions to make the global governance system more favorable uh, to China. So I think it's important also to say that although China's ambitions to some extent are global, um, there's really scant evidence that China seeks to supplant the United States as the sole global superpower. China's not looking to be a global policeman. Uh, it actually doesn't want to take on, I think, too many global burdens. China's not building aircraft carriers so it can transport Chinese troops to faraway places and overthrow leaders of foreign countries to install uh, leaders that are more friendly to China. I think that Beijing primarily wants to make the world safe for China's rise, and that's its primary goal. So regionally, China seeks to establish a Sino-centric order. Um, in my view, that vision isn't necessarily a recreation of the tributary system that we saw in the dynasties, um, although um, there might be some attributes of that. I wouldn't look to that as a model. I think China has a modern leadership that is really primarily looking forwards, um, not backwards. Um, but the bottom line of this system is that China's neighbors must accept China's preeminent status and not take actions that would be damaging to China's interest. So China, I think, will continue to use access to its markets as well as loans and aids as rewards and punishment. The Chinese think of this as economic statecraft. They have applied it to um, almost a dozen countries so far. Um, they see these tactics as successful. So I think that they will continue. Um, there, the um, Belt and Road, I think, uh, loans also are seen by China as creating economic dependence that in turn can be used to gain political influence. And so that's an area where I think uh, China thinks of in terms of its own vision for its role in the region. It's clear that China seeks a diminution of U.S. presence and influence in the region. We've known since the mid-90s that China has called U.S. alliances a Cold War relics. They now have more of a strategy, I think, to drive wedges between the United States and its allies and undermine their relevance. Um, I think it's indisputable. They want U.S. military forces in particular out of the region, and we can see some evidence in the single draft code of conduct and uh, the language that China has introduced there, and we can talk more on that in the Q&A if anyone is interested. Um, I would highlight the, what China is doing uh, militarily, which is really raising the, uh, the risks and potential costs of the United States to intervene um, in a crisis uh, with the goal uh, that the Chinese want to deter um, U.S. involvement in contingencies, whether they be in uh, the Taiwan Strait or, or elsewhere, so often referred to as anti-access area denial capabilities, as a series just this uh, last week put out by uh, Reuters, which I think is ongoing, uh, about China's military capabilities. And there's one in particular that highlights China's advantage in missiles in terms of their range, which is, um, I, I think, really goes to the point that um, uh, China has the capability now to reach uh, U.S. bases throughout the region, including in Guam, as well as uh, potentially ships. And this is an asymmetric capability that uh, that may really work to China's um, advantage. So um, I wanted to close just by making three points about what a Chinese-led order in Asia would look like. And um, that could be a whole talk in itself, but I thought I'd just highlight three points. Um, one is, should that scenario emerge, a Chinese-led Asia would result in countries in the region having less room to maneuver um, and uh, increased accommodation, I think, uh, to Chinese interest and constrained ability of smaller states to protect their own interests. Uh, secondly, I think the territorial disputes would likely be settled on um, Chinese terms. So one example would be Taiwan would likely feel compelled to reach an agreement with Beijing uh, that would probably be harmful to Taiwan's autonomy. As, uh, by the same uh, token, Southeast Asian claimants, I think, in the South China Sea uh, would probably be forced to make concessions that would undermine uh, their sovereignty. 
And then finally, I think uh, that a Chinese-led order would not bode well for multilateral regional institutions. Um, I think that they would be weakened, that China would continue to prioritize bilateral relationships, um, and to the extent that it was active in multilateral organizations, I think China would want to assume more of a uh, dominant role and an agenda-setting role. Uh, but organizations like ASEAN, East Asia Summit, maybe even APEC, um, would probably be um, weaker and less relevant uh, to the region and less able to solve uh, problems collectively. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Bonnie. I think that actually sets the stage very well for the for the rest of the panel. And at this point, I, I think we should narrow the lens a little bit um, and, and ask Lindsay to talk about w what to some extent, this uh, expanding, more ambitious China means for not just the United States militarily, but the other countries in the region. What kinds of decisions will that uh, force uh, confront these countries with? So, Lindsay, take take it away. Sure. Thanks so much, Mark. Um, and thanks to Maria and, and Brookings uh, for having me, and congratulations on the 20th anniversary. Um, so, uh, when I worked at the Pentagon, one of my former bosses, um, Ash Carter, he loved this particular quote. If you look back at his speeches, you can find it in a multitude of them. Uh, and what he liked to say was, um, security is like oxygen. When you have enough of it, you pay no attention to it. Uh, and when you don't have enough, you can't think about anything else. And I think um, that where we are right now in terms of the Asia-Pacific region is that for a long time, um, there was a sort of stability in the security sense that... Um, you know, we came to take for granted and that we're not there anymore and suddenly we're facing new questions about, um, you know, what do you do uh, to preserve as the project that Brookings is taking on, the idea of a long peace, you know? Are we, are we coming into a new era in which that peace is just gone? Um, or is there actually still an opportunity uh, to maintain what we've been enjoying for the last few decades? I think that... Uh, one of the key challenges that we're facing, one of the main reasons you're seeing sort of this shift um, is that this sort of preeminent military role that the United States enjoyed for a long time in the Pacific region, which really helped in a lot of ways, I think, create the space necessary for countries in the region to focus on economic prosperity and development. That military uh, edge, that military preeminence has declined, relatively speaking. It doesn't mean the United States is not still the, um, you know, the strongest, largest military we are, but the reality is um, the, the Delta has has shrunk. Um, and in particular, while the United States certainly is, you know, maybe the preeminent global military, in the Asia-Pacific theater in particular, that's simply, that's simply not the case. Because China has uh, advanced and modernized its military um, and largely focused all of those capabilities specifically on the Asia-Pacific region, whereas the U.S. military is dispersed globally. So in terms of the sort of shrinking preeminence of the U.S. military, where you see it so particularly, is in Asia. Um, the implications of this, I think, in some sense are less dire than you sometimes hear, but in another sense create a lot more complexities. Yes, the U.S. is still the largest military power. It still has a network of allies and security partnerships in the region um, that's unparalleled. And to a large extent, those relationships are more capable, more interoperable today than they were 20 years ago. Um, and I think at the end of the day, the United States does remain the security partner that most countries in the region look to. However, um, the challenge, I think, is one of credibility. Um, there are questions, both in terms of, uh, from U.S. allies, from U.S. partners, would the United States uphold its commitments in the region? Does it remain um, as committed to responding in the event of a crisis, given that now that crisis is likely to play out in a much messier, much longer, much harder way? Um, and so looking forward... While I don't think the United States is going to completely um, 
restore the sort of preeminent military dominance that it used to have in the region. Uh, what we see coming out of the Trump administration's um, national defense strategy, national security strategy, is an effort to, um, I guess, retain certain advantages militarily moving forward. Uh, but this is going to take a pretty significant strategic uh, strategic revamp. And while I think you see um, you see signs in the national defense strategy that uh, the Pentagon is moving in that direction, I think there are some fairly significant trade offs and things that will have to happen that that haven't happened yet. So, in particular, I want to point out I think three particular challenges in the military realm right now. One is that there's a much more complex, um, what I would say, deterrence environment in the Indo-Pacific. What does this mean? Well, we talk a lot about preventing uh, conflict, right? And sure, there's been no major sort of great power conflict in the Indo-Pacific for a very long time. However, we now have to look at not just preventing major power conflict, but how do you prevent the kinds of things that we're seeing, like uh, what we call gray zone aggression? These are the kinds of things that we talk about in the South China Sea or in the East China Sea. Um, you know, salami slicing tactics of maritime militia um, trying to sort of slowly expand um, political and security aims without sparking a major conflict. Conflict. How do you deal with the kinds of um, hybrid security challenges where maybe you have a threat in the cyber domain uh, as well as um, violent extremism combined with conventional challenges? Um, up to the high end of new emerging technologies, um, autonomous weapon systems. These are all kinds of things that now the United States and its allies and partners have to think about how do you prevent any of those problems from leading to aggression, even if it doesn't necessarily lead to a major great power conflict. And that becomes a much more complex sort of calculus of how you deter a much wider spectrum of aggression. Um, political and military challenges. The United States, in terms of its credibility, I think is primarily facing a political military problem of reassurance in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, and this is a problem with our allies and partners. Maybe you have the right capabilities, but will you really use them? But it's also a problem at home here in the United States right now. We see a lot of rhetoric coming from both sides of the aisle, quite frankly, about well, should the United States really be committed overseas in the same way? Is it maybe time to focus more on what we're doing at home? How much do these overseas commitments cost? Is it worth it? Um, these, I think, are some of the challenges that we have to push back on in the Indo-Pacific region. We've seen a lot of um, debates lately about uh, cost-sharing agreements when it comes to our bases in places like Japan and Korea. Certainly um, some challenges uh, negotiating these agreements. These are the kinds of things um, that eventually, if those political military challenges are allowed to fester, undermine um, the ability of the U.S. and its allies and partners to actually come together and bring military power to bear in the region. And then finally, I think there's an operational um, and an investment challenge. Uh, because you're having to deal with deterring a much wider spectrum of potential security problems in the region, you have to spread your investments uh, much more broadly. You have to think about how do we deal with potential counterterrorism challenges in the Philippines at the same time that you're trying to deal with new capabilities to address uh, space and counter space problems as well as cyberspace as well. Um, the U.S. is going to have to spread those investments much more broadly. That means it's also going to have to work what, much more with its allies and partners to think about what kinds of investments do we want allies and partners to be making? What kinds of investments do we need the United States to be making? The other aspect of this is, um, to some extent, the United States is thinking about how to modernize its forces, um, which means investing in new types of capabilities that we don't have yet. That money in the budget means that you're having to take money away from things like, let's say, aircraft carriers who are out in the region all the time on a daily basis. Um, and there are going to be trade-offs, budget 
uh, budgetary trade-offs that are going to have to be made here, that the U.S. and its allies are going to have to think much more uh, carefully about how they want to make. So I think there, there are four priorities in particular moving forward. One, the United States, I think, needs to clarify its commitments and intentions in the region uh, much more precisely and clearly. You saw recently that the Trump administration went out to the Philippines, clarified um, the standing of the Mutual Defense Treaty as it applies to the South China Sea. I think that was a really important step. It's one the Philippines had been um, asking for for a long time and one the United States had already made um, in terms of the Senkakus in the East China Sea. Um, but there are going to be a number of other decisions like this where the United States may not be able to um, firmly commit everywhere, but we need to be far more clear that in the places where the United States has alliance commitments and obligations, that it will absolutely stand behind those. There are going to be other places, I think, where um, for U.S. partners, the United States is looking at and will need to look at more going forward, how can we work with partners to help them enhance their own capabilities? Um, we see in Indonesia, in Vietnam, in India in particular, Countries don't necessarily want the United States to step in and do it for them, um, but they're looking to think how do they deter any kind of aggression in the region on their own, and the United States can be an important partner there. Um, updating not just capabilities, but also concepts of operation. How should countries respond to hybrid threats, to gray zone threats in the region? I think what we saw in the South China Sea from about 2013 to 2017 is that the U.S. and a lot of other countries didn't particularly have good concepts of how we ought to respond to these kinds of problems. People are just beginning to wrestle with this, but I think they're going to have to be a lot more creative about it going forward. And also I think we have to recognize that in a lot of these cases, the U.S. military regional militaries don't need to be in the lead. Um, and so it takes a much more integrated planning approach across the government. Um, prioritizing strategic depth is the third. And what I mean by this is in an environment that's much more multipolar, um, much more uncertain and contested, what you're going to need is much more strategic depth in your relationships, the kinds of capabilities that you have in the region, and where the United States probably wants military presence and access. Um, to do this, the United States is going to have to put a premium on having politically sustainable uh, relationships and access in the region. We can't simply be asking people uh, to pay more for everything um, and expect that they're going to be okay with that and everyone's going to welcome us with open arms. And then finally, I think that there's, a, there's definitely a need to focus on crisis and escalation management in the region going forward. Um, there's going to be a lot more uncertainty in the strategic environment, um, especially if you, as you have new technologies coming on board. Um, you're going to have much more likelihood that small miscalculations actually pull you into a much larger conflict. Uh, the Obama administration put some focus on confidence building me uh, measures in the maritime, the air domain, in cyberspace as well. But I think that uh, collectively the U.S. and China, as well as allies and partners, need to be thinking about what are the next kinds of areas where we need to talk about confidence building mechanisms. I would point to new technologies in particular, I think, is a really important area. Um, and then finally, along those lines, I also think we need to be talking about what arms control agreements in the Pacific uh, for the 21st century look like. We have a whole lot of potentially new technologies, dual-use technologies that can be used in the military domain as well, and there's no sort of agreement on how countries might want to employ these weapons um, and where we would draw the lines around um, what shouldn't be done. It's an incredibly important conversation uh, to be having. I'm sure Helen can speak a lot more about this, um, but... It, as we're pulling out of agreements uh, like the INF, um, we need to be thinking about what are the types of agreements that come next. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, I confess I hadn't thought of Ash Carter as the most quotable official, but that line about um, oxygen and security is a pretty memorable one. Um, uh, David, um, we're obviously in an intensely interesting period in your uh, realm. Um, we may be in the final stages of a U.S.-China trade deal. Uh, there's been some interesting reporting about the nature of that deal just in the last day or so. Uh, and uh, Xi Jinping has also been in Europe uh, signing up new people for the Belt and Road Initiative. So uh, take it away on the, uh, on the economic equation. Okay, thank you very much. Great pleasure to be here. So I'm going to talk about the changing economic environment and 
The theme here would be sustaining prosperity. Asia's done remarkably well for a long period of time. So key issue is how to sustain it. So I want to introduce four points, each relatively quickly. So I want to start with the Belt and Road Initiative, because that's on everybody's mind. We just had the big forum in Beijing last week. And I think the Belt and Road Initiative is largely welcome in the Asia-Pacific region and around the world. It's really a global program of financing infrastructure, particularly transport and power. Uh, there are some concerns, and I thought the interesting thing in Beijing last week is that Xi Jinping was apparently listening to the concerns and internalizing some of the concerns. So there was less triumphalism than there was two years ago at the first Belt and Road Forum, uh, and there was in some sense a mea culpa from the Chinese, recognizing that there were issues of project selection, competitive bidding, debt sustainability, uh, and so I, I saw the Chinese as reacting pragmatically. Jonathan Stromseth made the same point on the earlier panel, that the Chinese seem to be reacting pragmatic, pra, uh, pragmatically. Now, some of the issues are serious. Countries are concerned about the costs. You probably saw Malaysia uh, backed away from its high-speed rail. Uh, but the end result was the Chinese, they, they agreed on a reducing the project by about one-third in cost, and Mahathir was there in Beijing saying that uh, Malaysia is completely on board. Pakistan is interesting. They originally asked for a set of coal-fired power plants, and then a new government came in, and they wanted to switch to renewables. The Chinese said that's fine. So I think there are lots of examples of the Chinese pragmatically responding to what I think of as client demand. And also, in terms of financing, a lot of these loans are on commercial terms, and the poorest countries are going to have a lot of trouble servicing the debt. So we've already seen China reschedule Ethiopia, uh, Venezuela, probably other countries we don't know about. Now, it would be much better if China offered soft terms ex ante rather than rescheduling ex post. Uh, so you know, I, I don't want to paint too rosy a picture, but I see the Chinese pragmatically responding, and there is a need for infrastructure in the developing world, so I think a lot of this will probably work out relatively well. Where China succeeds in building good projects, the benefits are primarily going to go to the recipient country, but China is also going to benefit. Uh, for every country in Asia, China is a bigger trading partner than the United States, except for Afghanistan and Bhutan. They're in our column, okay? And 50 countries in Africa have more trade with China than the United States. So it's actually quite rational for China to be supporting infrastructure around the world because it'll benefit the recipient countries and it'll benefit China. And there'll be small benefits for the United States as well. Now, the second point I want to make is that in my long World Bank career, I always argued that policy reform was more important than the infrastructure investments. So I'm relatively enthusiastic about the infrastructure investments, but you really need, you need free trade, you need trade liberalization, you need customers facilitation, logistics, all of these things. There are a lot of good studies showing you that cutting the delays at the border by one day would be worth a lot of these expensive, you know, they would be the equivalent of these expensive infrastructure projects. And, you, you, you know, you cut those delays, not necessarily with infrastructure, but with, uh, with essentially customs facilitation and dealing with uh, red tape, corruption, these kind of issues. So the investments need to be complemented by policy reform. And here, this is where countries typically look to the United States to take the lead in promoting new trade agreements and increasingly deep trade agreements that get into some of these issues of trade facilitation and behind the border things. And so that's what's missing in Asia right now is the U.S. has withdrawn from the Trans-Pacific Partnership. I admire Japan for going ahead, but let's face it, without China or the U.S. in TPP, it's not that big, it's not that powerful. China is promoting the RCEP, but this is a relatively shallow agreement. So I think there is a risk that we're not moving ahead with new trade agreements in Asia Pacific, and that would be the traditional role of the U.S., and that's what's missing. Now, the third, I leave to last, or not last, but penultimate, the issue of the U.S. trade, uh, U.S.-China trade deal. I don't think it's that big a deal. I think the Neighbors, our partners in the region are very worried about the trade war and the risk of escalation, so they would like to see an agreement, and it looks like we're heading to an agreement. But I would argue that our partners are also, they're nervous about the agreement, because it seems that the main headline is going to be China agreeing to purchase various things, 
And almost all of that will impose losses on our partners. So we want soybean trade to be redirected from Brazil to the United States at Brazil's expense. We want LNG to be redirected from Australia to the U.S. at Australia's expense. We would like the U.S. to export more cars at the expense of Japan and the European Union, and so on down the line. So if there's a large shopping list from China, uh, frankly, a lot of countries in the region, or our partners more generally, are, are going to be unhappy about that. Now, on a more positive note, you know, we're also negotiating over market access issues, technology transfer, IPR protection. So to the extent that there's real progress on those issues, then everybody benefits. Right? Whatever agreement China makes in terms of market access with the U.S., that's going to be available to everybody. Uh, and if that were a deep, comprehensive agreement, in some ways it would, it would obviate my second point, that I don't see us moving toward deep new trade agreements, and I'm, I'm skeptical we're going to get a deep new trade agreement between China and the United States. And then the fourth point, quickly, which I just added listening to the colleagues up here. Um, so I, I want to agree with a point that I think Bonnie was making. Don't want to put words in your mouth, but you know, we often hear talk about China trying to undermine the global economic system. And I think of this particularly in terms of the international economic institutions like the World Trade Organization, the IMF, World Bank. I don't see China trying to undermine these at all. I see China trying to s strengthen its influence and deepen its involvement in these institutions. Uh, and there is, um, the Chinese, of course, have particular things they would like to see. You know, right now, they would like to see an expansion of the IMF, for example, and the United States is opposed to that. So what I worry about is that our primary international economic institutions will be eroding because the U.S. and China have a lot of disagreements about WTO reform, about IMF reform, and there's the potential for a grand bargain where we reach a compromise and we reinvigorate these institutions. But right at the moment, it seems we're very far away from any kind of grand bargain like that. And in the meantime, I think those, those institutions are eroding. And I'll stop there. David, thank you. Um, Helen, you're um, picking up the part of this, of this discussion that is the most mysterious to me. Um, I went to a conference uh, in Davos uh, that was dominated by AI and discussion of artificial intelligence. And at the end of it, I wasn't sure I understood it any better than at the beginning. So maybe you can help me uh, in that quest. Um, and in talking about the role that technology plays in this uh, new landscape. So go ahead. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Mark, and, and Maria, thank you for, for inviting me. Uh, it's great to take part in this. Um, so, so yeah, as, as you say, Mark, um, I will be focusing on AI in my remarks. That's not to say that it's the only technology that will be relevant in East Asia. Um, of course, you know, 5G is a bit the topic of the moment, and, and other technologies will be very, very relevant. Perhaps they can come up in the Q&A. Um, but I'd like to talk about uh, three characteristics of AI. And uh, before I do that, I'll give a, a brief sort of rundown of what AI actually is, because as, as Mark says, I think it's often kind of, there's often a lot of hand-waving that goes on. So uh, AI essentially means, artificial intelligence, obviously, essentially means getting computers to do things that seem smart in some way. And nowadays, when we talk about AI, we're usually talking about a sub-branch of AI called machine learning. And we're usually talking about a sub-branch of machine learning called deep learning. And so this is basically computer systems that are, have a, you know, a network that's very roughly structured based on the human brain. This is sometimes called neural networks. Um, that's what's involved in deep learning. And uh, uh, the first of the three characteristics I'd like to talk about um, of, of deep learning, I'll be using deep learning and, and AI interchangeably from here, um, is that it's, it's a, a general purpose technology. Uh, so this is a term from, from economics. And, and basically what I want to say with this point is that um, AI's effects will be felt across all sectors of society, across um, industry, science, um, basically everything, as well as the military angle, which often does seem to come up most. So, you know, this technology we have, uh, deep learning, it can be used for 
um, image recognition, uh, for speech recognition, translation, recommendation systems like you have in Amazon or Netflix. Um, these are relatively mature applications. And it's also showing a lot of promise um, in other areas like uh, robotics, so building robotic systems that are more flexible and, and, and able to be adaptable, um, more than what we see in, for example, traditional industrial settings. Um, it's also promising for uh, sequential decision-making of the kind we're starting to see in, in games, for example, in video games or in games like Go. Um, and it's, it's getting better at, at generating things like images and text. Um, so these, you know, these, these last few are more emerging areas that are less mature. But because it has this very wide ranging, or these very wide ranging potential uses, um, again, the first characteristic is it's a general purpose technology, and the implication of that, or a very important implication, is that AI's effects on the world, and including its effects on, on East Asia, are going to be primarily in, I would say, the, the economic and scientific domains. So primarily, it's going to lead to growth across the board, uh, it's going to be deployed widely across industry, it's going to lead to uh, scientific progress in areas like healthcare, energy, uh, transportation, things like this. Um, I think overall it, it shows a lot of promise to be really, really valuable for society in general. Of course, this is not without caveats. So um, there's obvious concerns about uh, privacy and bias and uh, safety and reliability of these systems. And uh, you know, in the international setting, if we're talking about economic and scientific benefits, there's also um, in East Asia and in the U.S.-China relationship, of course, concerns around you know, not having a level playing field, around IP theft, um, all of these types of concerns. But I think it's important when we're talking about um, AI in, in an international or a geopolitical setting to just lay this backdrop of uh, the sort of economic, scientific, broadly shared, cross-boundary, um, cross-border effects being the largest ones that we're talking about here. The second characteristic I'll talk about is that these systems, uh, as of today, are fairly unreliable uh, and fairly unpredictable in many ways. So they work just fine if you want to be using them again for you know, Netflix telling you what show you should recommend next or Facebook suggesting which friend is in your photo from that party last night. Um, but if you have it in an unmanned undersea vessel that might encounter an unmanned undersea vessel of another nation, that's a totally different story. And these algorithms are just not at all ready for the prime time in, in those kinds of settings. Um, so if we're talking about any kind of more uh, critical applications where getting things right on the first try is important, aka anything involving the military, not to mention other sectors, um, we need to be really careful about how we're using these systems, about uh, potential... Um, for example, if we have two sides in some kind of conflict situation, increasingly delegating their decision-making to automated systems like this, uh, does that give the potential for unintended escalation where human operators would have stepped in and, and made some changes and, and changed course? Um, these systems just are not uh, able to do well in nuanced and novel situations in the ways that, that humans can, can do better. Um, and it also implies that there is, there's space for... Um, investment in, in research to make these systems better and that that investment can, again, benefit uh, all countries. Uh, so, for example, um, investments in, in sort of uh, the uh, safety and security of nuclear weapons, for example, permissive action links, which allowed um, uh, weapons to be locked down unless they were being activated by a certain specific person with certain specific permissions. That technology was one that the, that the U.S. very readily handed over to the Soviet Union because it was in everyone's interest um, for nuclear weapons to, to work in this way. And so similarly, I think there are many opportunities for um, research in these directions. Uh, the third characteristic I'll talk about um, is that research in these areas, uh, so in, in AI, machine learning, deep learning, is very open and distributed across the world in a way that uh, especially U.S. decision makers, I think, are not used to thinking about with novel technologies that have military relevance. So they're, they're used to thinking in terms of um, uh, nukes, in terms of stealth, uh, 
in terms of these technologies that were developed in you know, government labs or by government contractors, and that therefore could be potentially locked down if need be and held within borders and things like this. This is not how the AI research ecosystem works. Um, AI, research is, AI research is being done uh, by universities all around the world, by companies all around the world, Labs within companies are publishing their research openly. That's how strong this norm is, that, that you know, um, within industry, it's not possible to um, hold research within the bounds of a, of a given company. Um, so I think this just means that uh, there certainly are applications of AI that um, a given country might wish another country was not able to use. So for example, uh, if you're trying to deploy AI in, uh, in a military setting, you would hope to have some advantage over adversaries. Uh, certainly, from the perspective of, of liberal democracies, it seems like uh, uh, China is beginning to use these technologies in undesirable ways, for example, for facial recognition or for um, uh, tracking undesirable behavior. Uh, but, but and, and this is certainly something that is very concerning and that we should be trying to think of how we can combat. But... Uh, because of the nature of how this research is being done, I would argue that it is not feasible to simply try and lock down or secure, for example, American innovation within America um, in the way that is sometimes discussed, because uh, that is going to, firstly, not work, and secondly, uh, be really counterproductive for American competitiveness and for America as a destination for the world's best and brightest, both in terms of individual researchers and in terms of uh, successful companies and, and successful universities. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll leave it there and we can delve into some of those issues more in the Q&A. Thank you very much, Helen. And, and I'm glad you said you'd also be willing to talk about 5G. Um, I, I just noticed sort of walking over here that um, the Prime Minister of Britain has actually fired the British Pre uh, Defense Secretary uh, over um, leaks from a meeting that had to do with uh, the role of Huawei in building out the 5G network in Britain. So clearly um, that is an issue that's resonating all over the world uh, in, in interesting ways. So why don't I, I'll just ask a couple of questions and I'll throw it very quickly to the audience um, because I think your questions are probably more um, interesting anyway. But my here's my first my first thought, and this comes from my vantage point as a, a White House correspondent. I cover uh, Donald Trump for a living, uh, and one of the one of the, one of the questions I often wrestle with, um, and I thought of it again when uh, Vice President Biden declared his candidacy um, recently, and he and he used this phrase. He said, "We're living in an aberrant moment in in American history," which sort of applies implies rather that we can return with a, a different president uh, to an old way of the way the world works and the role of America in the world. Um, but but I've been been detecting in reading and talking to people a sort of a growing recognition that it doesn't matter who replaces Donald Trump, some of the things that have changed in the last few years are not ever going to go back to the way they were before. And so I thought I would just sort of put that as a general question to anyone on the panel who wants to tackle it. The changes that have happened in Asia and in the American role in Asia, um, how much of that is purely a function of this very unusual president and the ideas he has and could be reversed under a Joe Biden or or another president, and how much of it simply is never going to be the same again, um, and 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 so to some extent, merely a recognition on his part of how the world has changed and the role America plays in it. Um, so, and anyone who wants to take a crack at that, I'm happy to start with the economic side of that. Um, so it it seems to me that a lot of the big tectonic shifts predate Trump, and Trump might be more of a response than a cause of this. And so me, for me, a key moment was the global financial crisis, which emanated from Wall Street, had a devastating effect on the U.S. and the world. Before the global financial crisis, the U.S. economy was five times bigger than China. And by, the, by today, the U.S. is about 50% bigger than China. So we're still bigger. But within a few years, China is going to be the biggest economy in the world. So I think you know, that's a shift that was going to occur. It's been accelerated, and that it influences a lot of these other, other issues we're talking about. But then having said that, so that, that's something that's, that's definitely changed. We can't go back. right? We can't be five times bigger than China. But I still think the best response – 
is to strengthen multilateral institutions, you know, economic institutions, my area. And that's still a winning strategy. And Trump has definitely taken us far away from that. And I think most of the Democrats running are, are uh, talking about strengthening our participation in global institutions in general. So I still think that's a winning strategy for the U.S. Bonnie. So I, I would agree with that. If you look um, at the uh, military and security realm, uh, what's going on in the economic realm, of course, is, is um, uh, also reflected in the military competition. You know, China has something like 400 surface combatants and submarines, and the, and the estimate is that they will have 530 by uh, maybe it's 2030, something like that. I forget the exact um, uh, prediction. Uh, the point is that the, the military balance uh, was shifting, is going to continue to shift uh, because China has prioritized its military modernization, uh, because it is um, uh, capable of uh, doing so. And this is China's backyard where pretty far away and there's only so much military capability that we're going to base in the region. Um, and it's not surprising that the Chinese have sought to achieve uh, military advantages over the United States. But I come down in the same place uh, that David does, and that is that the policy response uh, could change under uh, a new president. And if, a, if the policy response changes, then the receptivity of countries in the nation, in, in the region, and then their policies uh, could change. Uh, so uh, we have, have not been uh, very proactive in uh, multilateral arrangements, nor have we been utilizing our alliances in, uh, in very effective ways. Uh, but our alliances are not in tatters either. Uh, and uh, there is ample uh, room for strengthening them uh, if we have a president that uh, celebrates champions and, and wants to further utilize uh, those alliances. And so there is this sort of a bit of, I think, of an, of an interactive nature. If, 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 if U.S. policies uh, towards alliances are more positive than perhaps the uh, responses than you get from Japan, Korea, but then also non-allies like partners in Southeast Asia uh, that really don't want to choose between the United States and China, but they also want the United States present. They want alternatives. They want to balance uh, China's rise. And so even though China's rise is inevitable, the kind of choices they make is in part determined by the choices and the policies that we make. Lindsay, I want you to weigh in too, but I, I just wanted to, before you do, in the context of the military discussion, it has been my impression that no agency has been more successful perhaps at uh, slow walking some of what this White House wants to do than the Pentagon, um, you know, whether it's in, uh, you know, s some of the issues around uh, basing and deployments in the Korean Peninsula or, or, or other areas. And, and maybe that was more true under the previous defense secretary than under the acting defense secretary we have now. But I, I, I'm interested in asking you as well um, whether you see um, some of the trends that you described earlier in terms of the military uh, balance uh, as changing much under a next president, or are we simply on a kind of a, 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 a kind of an inex inexorable path? Um, so I, I would agree with both Bonnie and David that I think, in particular, when you look at some of the military trends you're seeing, they were in play way before um, President Trump. And actually, when you look at some of the specific types of investments and things that, the, that China's made on the military side. I mean, they were, they were influenced by events um, much longer ago. Um, uh, and I don't think that the overall trend line um, in terms of a narrowing gap between the United States and China uh, is going to change. However, um, this is, I think, why I tried to emphasize in my remarks that what it, what it requires then is a fundamentally different strategic approach. Um, you could make much better use, as Bonnie said, um, of the allies and partners and their own um, security and military capabilities in the region. We shouldn't want to go back 
um, because we shouldn't want to go back to a day where militarily it was, here's the big U.S. military and other countries are far less capable. We now have very capable allies and partners who are working alongside us, and that's something that the United States should welcome. Um, but I do think that um, the U.S. has to think far more carefully um, and has to be much more creative, frankly, um, about how it works with allies and partners, the kinds of technologies and investments it makes, um, and you just have to be, I think, a lot more uh, rigorous about decisions and trade-offs because the notion that we can sort of like just buy our way um, out of this on the military side is is just wrong. Great. Um, in terms of, you know, Bonnie, you said that, and David, I think you uh, echoed this, that that this notion of China as a purely revisionist power isn't quite right, that China's goal isn't necessarily to upend uh, the system, but just to be more influential within it. And, and, and David, I think you, you talked about this uh, Belt and Road Forum as having a kind of a mea culpa aspect to it. Is there a sense that in both the economic and the geopolitical military sphere uh, that China has overreached in the last couple of years? And if so, how does that play itself out? I mean, is this a tactical retreat by Xi Jinping? Uh, and once he's got everyone calmed down again, he just returns to his path? Or are there broader implications to what these various pushbacks uh, might amount to in terms of the future progression? Go first, David, and then Bonnie. Okay, I mean, I think I think that's a great question. So I think on the economic side, it's definitely worth thinking about a certain amount of overreach. You know, when all of this started a few years before Xi Jinping branded it, and a lot of it was driven by China's very large overall surplus, meaning they had to invest somewhere in the world. So they start this thing, and it's accelerating, and meanwhile, their surplus has disappeared. You know, so they're not playing with their own money anymore. I mean, they're basically borrowing on international capital markets and lending, and all of that is very risky, and they're technocrats, uh, I think, you know, are quite worried about the scale. So then you get pushback from some of the countries I mentioned, you know, Malaysia and others, and I think it, it's sort of convenient for China to be listening uh, to these countries, because it's and then it's also listening to its own technocrats and many of its own people as reflected in the internet. People are, you know, why are we building all this infrastructure around the world when we still have a lot of important needs in China. So I think it is a, a kind of tactical pullback on the Chinese side. Bonnie. I think a lot of Chinese scholars and potentially foreign experts see overreach. I'm not convinced that Xi Jinping sees overreach. Um, uh, and, and I don't want to limit this just to the Belt and Road, uh, but... If you look at, for example, the island building in the South China Sea, let's remember the 19th Party Congress political report that Xi Jinping said very clearly that this was one of his achievements in the first five years. Um, China has clearly shifted the status quo in the South China Sea in its favor. It has paid a very low cost, if any, I think. Um, so now it's consolidating. We'll see how long it takes before they begin to push forward again. Um, you could look at the situation in the Taiwan Strait and the amount of economic, military, political pressure that Xi Jinping is putting on Taiwan, the number of countries that um, have shifted their recognition uh, in favor of the PRC um, and uh, abandoning Taiwan. Some of this is in, in China's favor. Um, we can argue about whether or not it's in China's interests. I mean, some people, again, might say, that's overreach, and it will create a backlash. Uh, but I think that Xi Jinping is a confident leader, that he sees that in most of the policies that he's pursuing, that he has been um, uh, successful. It doesn't mean you don't tweak things or, along the way, and I think the Belt and Road may stand out as a maybe um, a, a, a unique uh, policy that's being pursued that you, know, you could argue really the whole policy existed before it was ever announced. I mean, the 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 the, Zotru, the go out policy sort of evolved into uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, and, you know, the way that it's been implemented has created some perhaps challenges for China. But even then, the, the majority of the international community has welcomed it. Um, and this is a symbol of China wanting to be part of the world and contribute to global development. And when the United States said, 
you know, this is a terrible idea. It's debt, diplom- debt, debt trap diplomacy and all of that. You know, most countries said, uh-uh, uh, I, don't, I don't view it that way. And we welcome these, um, uh, these loans be- because who's providing alternatives? There aren't many other alternatives that, that they can use. So I think it's generally been good for China's international image with the exception of, yeah, there's a few countries that are created problems. But if we talk about China taking over assets, um, as a result of these uh, these debts, we still only have really one, right? It's uh, Hanban Toda, you know, uh, is is the only case in in Sri Lanka. So there there might be more, but uh, so far that's that's it. So I don't know. I guess I wish that there was evidence that Xi Jinping had concluded that he had overreached and therefore was. Uh, tacking or revising his strategy, but I, I just don't see much evidence in that. Okay. Um, but Helen, just before I go to the audience, I wanted to ask you one sort of very basic question on AI. I've read a multitude of articles that say that Chinese are going to eat our lunch in AI. And then I've read a couple of articles that say, actually, that's total nonsense. Uh, we have, you know, such a deep advantage over them uh, and that, you know, Xi Jinping announcing billions in development uh, means little compared to where we are today. So can you give me your sort of just take on that basic question? Yeah, for sure. And of course, it's hard to make predictions, especially about the future, but I'll try. Um, uh I think my basic take is that this is the U.S.'s to lose, essentially. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit, well, I'll, I'll knock down one argument that I find very frustrating that I think is, has um, caught on uh, more than it should have, which is this idea that uh, essentially, you know, data is the new oil, it's this ma- super important input for AI, and because China has more citizens than the U.S., and because it has weaker privacy protections around the data of those citizens, it therefore has this fundamental advantage in data, which is this key input to AI, so China has this fundamental advantage in AI. And I think that takes sort of chains together two kind of weak arguments and creates like really quite a weak um, total argument. And the reason is this, is that firstly, data is not that crucial an input to AI systems, or it's not always a, a crucial input to AI systems. Um, and certainly, uh, it's, not a, uh, it's not a monolithic input. So different types of data are needed for different types of systems. Some types of data need sorry, some types of AI systems need consumer data. So I think it is true that the Pentagon would have real trouble if it tried to open a food delivery startup in Shanghai because it just doesn't have the data on what those consumers want. Um, But if we're talking about um, self-driving cars, that's a totally different type of data. If we're talking about analyzing satellite imagery, you want satellite imagery. You don't want, you know, how your consumers are using WeChat um, and so on and so forth. Um, so I think that, I think when people are making the argument that China is going to eat our lunch, that's often a large component. And I think that is not a very, um, not a very good point. I think two other inputs, um, to having a strong AI industry, um, doing cutting edge AI research. Um, one is, is hardware. So semiconductors and chips and the U S is just doing really, really well in that industry. And China is trying its best to catch up and is catching up in some of the sort of, um, lower tech parts of that industry, but is really struggling at the higher tech end. Um, And another really crucial input um, is human capital. And this is where the U.S. just leads by far. You know, I was in in Beijing studying last year and uh, was friends with two master's students in in machine learning. And for them, it was so obvious that, of course, everyone in their grade wants to go and work in America for the American companies. Of course, obviously. Um, And I think we can really underestimate from here, you know, from sitting in this country, how much of a magnet we are for the best and brightest from around the world. And I think that is leading us to risk squandering that advantage because we don't see how valuable it is. Thank you. That's that's very helpful answer. Um, listen, we have about 20 minutes left, and so I'm just going to go straight to the audience. Um, there, I see several hands. I would just ask uh, for you to identify yourself, uh, if you could, and to please keep the questions um, somewhat brief. And there's a lady in the back in the blue, and why don't I start with her, and then I'll come to these gentlemen here. Uh, thank you, reporter from Voice of America. I, uh, um, fin- the Financial Times <laughs> reported on Sunday uh, saying that uh, Admiral Richardson uh, told his counterpart in China that 
its non-military vessels will not will be treated as the P- PLA vessels. So my question is, will this shift of views in the United States uh, increase the possibility of conflict in the, uh, between the United States and China in the South China Sea? Thank you. So I guess Lindsay or Bonnie, yeah. Um, so I think, what, I think what's important here is um, a, a recognition on the U.S. government side that um, if China has a broad uh, range of vessels that are behaving in a way and at times coming under a chain of command that is military and not simply civilian, that the United States expects um, and would treat Um, those vessels not as purely civilian vessels because that is not the way that they are actually operating and behaving. And so the statement, I think, is is trying to um, reflect on the American side, hey, you can't expect us to just simply treat this as a fishing ship uh, when it's not actually operating uh, and behaving that way. Um, I don't think that that has to, and I don't think anyone would want to see that lead um, to conflict. I think actually what ought to happen um, is that you start leading toward more responsible behavior um, where ships are um, not taking the types of risky behavior that would lead toward um, conflict. Ultimately, that's what we should be we should be pushing toward. So I don't think what the United States is trying to do is to create a more adversarial situation, but simply saying, hey, if you're going to have these ships that are not purely civilian, then you can't expect that we actually look at them and treat them that way. Bonnie? Yeah, I, I guess I would just add that uh, the change in the U.S. position is ultimately motivated by the fact that the Chinese have felt that they can um, operate uh, in destabilizing ways and particularly put pressure on uh, other uh, countries in the region um, uh, with impunity using non-military vessels. So this is an effort uh, to cre- in- to inject some unpredictability about how the U.S. would respond and by doing so strengthen deterrence. That said, the U.S. doesn't want a military confrontation uh, with China, and I personally find it difficult to come up with a scenario in which the United States would use a Navy vessel against a Coast Guard or militia vessel. So if you talk about, for example, a specific uh, FON op, let's say the U.S. is conducting, if China were to try and interfere with that freedom of navigation operation with a law enforcement vessel that is a white-hulled vessel, um, what do we think the United States Navy ship is going to do? Are we going to deliberately ram that ship? Um, maybe we want the Chinese to think that, that we will, but my guess is that we would not. So I, I myself have really not come up with a, a contingency in which the United States would actually do this. But as Lindsay said, it is driven by the fact that the, the Chinese command system, if you look at these, the maritime militia exercises with the Chinese Navy, the Coast Guard is now under the Central Military Commission. So these are really, in a sense, all military ships. But I think it's, it, it, it's really intended to inject some uncertainty which theref- about how the U.S. would respond and therefore strengthen deterrence. Okay. Uh, the gentleman here in the second row. Uh, hi, uh, Yuan Kang Wang uh, with Western Michigan University. I have a question for Helen. Very fascinating uh, talk. And I, I'm wondering, because you talk about China using facial recognition, and as far as we know, China is trying to build a surveillance state. And so how does AI help in their regard, right? Or what is possible based on what we know? How can AI help, you know, a country that's interested that's interested in building a surveillance network? And also, is there any way that we can fight it? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good and important question. I think the thing I would say up front is that I think so far, China is not using AI very much in its social control system. So I think there's been a lot of concern recently about, you know, China's social credit system being some massive AI-powered, you know, omnipresent uh, 
thing that is, you know, controlling the lives of all its citizens, which is completely overblown. So most of the social control China is um, is currently exercising is is powered by people, um, you know, by thousands and thousands of, of people sitting in a room censoring individual or blacklisting individual terms, and they get censored from WeChat and, and so on. Um, so right now, I think the main way they're using it that I'm aware of is in facial recognition. So this is looking, for example, at surveillance footage and recognizing um, people from that. Um, they're using that in, in certain settings, not in all of the surveillance cameras that they that they have deployed. Um, but at, because, as I said, uh, deep learning is such a general purpose technology, um, I think there will be plenty of creative ways that it can be used. Um, for example, uh, you could imagine uh, going through someone's messaging history and using natural language processing to pull out um, you know, suspicious things that they had written in a way that might be too resource intensive to do by hand. Um, if you had an algorithm that could do that automatically, you could potentially, you know, flag suspicious behavior more effectively. Um, things like that. So I think, um, uh, I think there will be plenty of ways that the Chinese government will think to, um, to use these technologies um, for what they are trying to do, which is, you know, cement their own control. In terms of what we can do about it, um, it's a really good question. I think, um, I hope that discussion on this deepens and goes beyond, uh, well, we shouldn't work with the Chinese on anything, um, or well, we shouldn't let Chinese students study here, because I think those suggestions are unrealistic and uh, also probably won't help very much. Um, I think also going back to the discussion before about um, uh, sort of, what is going to be the same after this administration changes and what is going to be different. Um, I think one thing that has been regrettable um, so far in this administration is that the positioning is very much a U.S. versus China, sort of two countries, and we happen to be on Team U.S. because we're in the U.S., and if you're in China, I guess you're on Team China. Um, and I think that's a really uh, weak framing for the U.S. because there's just two countries, you know, who knows? Um, and I think it, it, it would serve us much better to really center the values that the U.S. was founded on, you know, freedom, democracy, prosperity, and uh, bring in our allies who are also uh, committed to those values and think about um, what are the norms for use, uses of these technologies, what types of technologies um, should we feel comfortable developing at our universities and, and having our companies develop. Um, and I think that will end up with a more nuanced answer um, and will be a long process, uh, but I think it will la lead to an answer that is more um, sustainable and that will stick as opposed to just being a question of which team do you happen to choose. Okay. Um, whoa, a lot of hands. Um, <laughs> um, there's. Uh, I'll go kind of in order of the way people raise them. So the gentleman on the aisle was next, and then the lady in front of him will be after him, and then these two gentlemen over here. Thank you for doing this. Uh, my name is Dong Huiyu with China Review News Agency of Hong Kong. Uh, my question is for Bonnie. Um, uh, yesterday, the National Committee of the uh, Foreign Policy uh, released a report on the a closed door uh, track to dialogue on cross trade relations in New York in the beginning of uh, April. You are one of the particip participants. And uh, the report uh, suggests that uh, when the uh, election seasons are coming, uh, uh, there should be uh, this refrains and no surprises among the three parties. Um, do you believe this proposal can be accepted or can be achieved by the three sides in the context of the U.S.-China increasing strategic competition and the upcoming Taiwan's election? Thank you. I guess I think it depends on how you... Uh, understand the phrase no surprises. Uh, so um, there are certainly decisions that the United States might make in its policies towards Taiwan that uh, China doesn't like, um, and the United States should not put its relationship with Taiwan on ice just because Taiwan is having elections or because we are heading into our election season. Uh, we have an important relationship with Taiwan, so a lot of things should go forward. And that should include arms sales, frankly. Um, and we don't consult with China about arms sales. 
So one could imagine an arms sales being made and that being seen by China as violating a sort of understanding or this prescription in the report of no surprises. So that might be one example in which it is uh, perhaps difficult uh, to realize. Um, that said, it's a, it's a good idea if uh, all three sides are as transparent as they can be um, uh, and it, it, to decrease... Uh, unpredictability and uncertainty where possible. Um, I think certainly um, all of the participants should refrain from any actions that would really intensify instability. And the first that I would point to would be a repetition of the uh, action that was taken several weeks ago in which two Chinese fighter jets flew across uh, the center line of the Taiwan Strait for approximately 43 kilometers in a total of about 12 minutes for the first time in 20 years. It was destabilizing, and that kind of action really should not be repeated. Okay. The lady in the second row. Yes, one of the uh, speakers from the previous panel. I, my first question is uh, David Dollar. Uh, I think uh, China um, facing much criticism about the BRI. Uh, I think I read that they are saying they are very much willing to work with uh, global institutions like World Bank and IMF and so forth. Um, but uh, would, because you worked in World Bank a long time, right? But uh, those institutions, global economy institutions, are still heavily influenced by USA. But now World Bank president uh, used to be a very strong China critique. So is, is uh, there a chance that these institutions will embrace China to increase their influence within institutions rather than, uh, you know, the China is creating uh, their own institution? That's number one. Because I've, I, I heard Europeans, for example, are more willing to do so compared to Americans. And to the second question to Boni, you talked a lot about the Chinese norms in selective area, but still it's very big to me. When they want to China-centered order, you know, we are talking rules and norms and so forth. But when, when I say norm, especially in social science, it's more like internalized values, right? So we voluntarily comply to what Chinese are saying, you know, what is right or wrong, what is red meat and red meat. But I don't see a kind of a good measurement whether many countries are willing to accept the Chinese norms at least, of course, soft power is different from norms, but if I see the, the survey relating to soft power, Chinese soft power is still, still far much low and lagging behind the major Western powers. Uh, thank you. So the, for the question for me, I would say that up till now, the World Bank and the IMF have both been willing to be helpful to China on the Belt and Road. Uh, the World Bank has been very helpful to the development of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. I realize that's somewhat separate. It's not really that directly involved in Belt and Road, but just as an analogy, the World Bank would love to work together with China Development Bank, which is the largest uh, conduit of funds for the Chinese program. But frankly, CDB is not very transparent. You know, hasn't really been that interested in working with the World Bank. So I would say it's it's been difficult. And, and, and as you say, there was definitely talk in Beijing last week about Chinese institutions working more with the Bretton Woods institutions. I would point out that the, in the case of the IMF, the Chinese have given the IMF a $50 million grant to do training on debt sustainability in Belt and Road countries. And it's an example of you know, China deepening its relationship with the IMF. And I think the IMF has walked a pretty good line, good middle ground of being critical about some aspects of Belt and Road while being largely supportive. As you say, there's now a new president of the World Bank. I, I suspect the World Bank will still be open to working with China, uh, partly because there are a lot of other countries that are members, and you know these big bureaucracies are like battleships. That, you know, they're really hard to turn around. So I think World Bank is happy to work together with China, and if it hasn't happened that much, it's, it's mostly because it's difficult. So I agree with you that China has fairly weak soft power, if you define soft power in the way that 
uh, most people do in the West, that it's essentially um, a result of uh, attraction and it's bottom up and it comes from civil society um, and culture. Uh, the, I mean, the Chinese are really thinking about soft power as more top down. It's created by the state. Um, and I think they believe that they've made some headway, uh, but they, um, in, in many areas, they lag behind. Uh, but that's not to say that they haven't made progress in terms of inserting norms into multilateral institutions documents, resolutions. And if you look at the UN, I think the Human Rights Council is, is, is in fact, I'm forgetting who the expert is um, at Brookings, your colleague, who wrote on the UN um, Human Rights Council and China's um, uh, actions. Ted Pakone. Ted Pakone, thank you very much. Um, excellent. I would commend it to you all. Um, and uh, there's also been several things that have been written by experts on what China has tried to do in the uh, conversation on cyber and internet governance up at the UN. Uh, and uh, some people may downplay some of uh, this language, even inclusion of community of common destiny, um, but it is representative of an effort to insert authoritarian values, to undermine what are universal um, values and human rights. And let's remember that when Hu Jintao was general secretary and president, um, there was a push in China to actually um, accept the idea of universal values. And that has been completely uh, rejected by Xi Jinping. And now they have developed their own notion of socialist core values. And so I, I don't think that we should, com we should dismiss the notion that China is making some progress in this area. And it's an erosion of the kind of democratic and uh, and liberal values that I believe have have been the um, the the underpinning of the uh, the post World War II liberal international order. And China doesn't accept those norms; it accepts the institutions, but not the norms. Okay, I think I think we have time for about two more. So this gentleman over here with the with the baseball cap. Hi. Um, my name is Elliot Hurwitz. I want to thank the panel for a very good presentation. I'd like to follow up on um, Ms. Mrs. Toner's uh, comments on human capital. Um, first, I'd like to say that uh, most indices of educational attainment show that the U.S. is far behind and is getting worse than many other countries, especially including the PRC um, in high school and college and so on. Secondly, the PRC, and there are, I'd like to discuss the trends in this area. The PRC has enormous activities in, this, in, in the human capital area. And so it, it seems to me that sooner or later they're going to be ahead of us. And, and third, oh, they, okay, so the only thing is trends that I'd like you to discuss. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks a lot for the question. Um, so I think there's a distinction to be made between um, what, uh, how the domestic populace is being educated versus where sort of outstanding talent is ending up doing, spending their professional lives. Um, so the U.S. just absolutely is home to the best high-tech workforce on the planet, and a large portion of that high-tech workforce was not educated in the U.S., but they want to come here for a variety of reasons. Um, so I think there is... Um, I think we could have a whole other conversation about, you know, what what uh, education policy should be doing um, to keep up with changing times, um, primary and secondary education, and to some extent tertiary as well. Um, I think in terms of trends, so China is certainly making very active efforts um, to recruit some of these kinds of top talents. Um, they are working to some extent. They're not working nearly as well as China would like. And I really think that if the U.S. were to double down on, on our own advantages, um, we could really, you know, fairly easily neutralize the small success that those programs are having, simply because <laughs> it's a, it's a, we're a really nice place to live. Like, it's just really good to live here. The air is clean. The water is clean. The government is, like, works really pretty well, considering... Um, <laughs> Uh, 
<laughs> at the local level. <laughs> In terms of political freedom, you know, freedom of organization, freedom of religion, uh, all of this stuff. Um, again, I think it's really easy to take for granted once you're here, and it's really not something that is taken for granted um, in countries where it is not so. And I think China is a country where it is not so. So I, I, I think my, my overall take to this would, would again be this is essentially ours to lose, and uh, the way to, to do better would be to double down on our strengths. Uh, thank you, Helen. Okay, we have one last question. I want to keep it short um, and the answer short, too, if I please. And this gentleman over here has been waiting. Uh, hi. My name is Carl Pulzer, and I have a project called the Center on Capital and Social Equity. And my, my, my question goes to the na basic relationship of China to the United States. Is there an element of complementarity in what, what we're doing with each other that provides some strategic stability in that they make a lot of stuff for us they make a lot of money and they put it back into our economy through buying our bonds. So if anything really went wrong, um, and it, at very low interest rates, so it's not hurting us that much in the long run to have a lot of capital outflow, but we have a lot of their security in our hands with these investments they have in our, in our bonds. Uh, the second part of the question is, what if interest rates went up? And then there's a destabilizing factor of more capital flowing out of this country just to, you know, to uh, finance our entitlements and et cetera. David? Uh, my, you know, my quick reaction is you're, you're, you're basically right that there are economic benefits on both sides. You know, they're, 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 they go beyond what you just discussed, but they include what you just discussed. So, so any effort to decouple China and the United States is going to be costly to both sides because there are real benefits. And then, and then I would argue we have a lot of areas of common interest, like climate change is, is one of the best examples. So, you know, li listening to the wonderful panelists, we've got a lot of areas of tension, and then I would argue we have a lot of areas where we could potentially work together. A good note to end that on. Um, so I'd like to thank all these panelists for a terrific conversation and thank you all for listening until the the bitter end and now comes the the sweet send off thank you <laughs> thank you very much good afternoon everyone i'm Mireya solis director of the center for east asia policy studies and i would like to offer a very f uh, brief uh, words uh, before we close the program and i emphasize i'll be brief i realize that uh, we've been here for a while uh, we care about every single program that we organize, every single event that we organize, but I have to say that today is particularly uh, special. It is special because we're launching, launching a new project for the foreign policy program on sustaining the East Asia peace that will look squarely at the risk of conflict, the character of any Asian peace, and the durability of such peace in the midst of technological and geopolitical transitions. With this initiative, we seek to develop and offer timely policy recommendations to sustain U.S. political, defense, and economic engagement in the region. But today is doubly special because we're celebrating our 20th anniversary. Our center has changed much in the past two decades. We went from one senior fellow to five, and we also expanded the coverage of our region, so much so that we had to change the name of our center. We went from the Center for Northeast Asia Policy Studies to the Center for East Asia Policy Studies. But not all has been changed. We have been constant in our commitment to in-depth policy research and our commitment to address key issues facing U.S. foreign policy in East Asia. These issues include war and peace, the future of the regional order, and particularly its economic architecture, and issues of governance in an array of national political systems. Today's celebration is a joyful um, occasion, allowing us to reconnect, reconnect to our visiting fellow alumni and to remain engaged with old and new friends. And it's certainly an opportunity to give thanks. Our center owes much to the Brookings leadership, past and present, and so I would like to express my gratitude to Strobe Talbot, Martin Indyk, John Allen, and Bruce Jones. One person above all deserves credit. With appreciation and admiration, I would like to recognize Richard Bush, the person who has contributed most in making the Center for East Asia Policy Studies what it is today. Of the 20 years of CAP, Richard has been at the helm, um, a center director, was at the helm a center director for 16 years. CAP has thrived and flourished thanks to Richard's dedication, talent, and grit. <laughs>
Richard has now. Richard has passed administrative duties to me, so he is therefore freer to pursue his research and scholarship and offer policy advice uh, that will be sorely needed in the challenging times ahead. Stay tuned for his next book on Taiwan, which will be a major uh, contribution. In closing, I would like to thank the panelists and moderators for offering valuable insights in today's sessions to express my appreciation to all members of the Center for East Asia Policy Studies for your hard work and collegiality every day. And uh, to please ask all of you in joining me with a round of applause with a special recognition uh, to Richard. Thank you. And with that, we conclude. Thank you so much. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.